Because about this time of year, I really start getting pumped up about deer season. I really, really do. It's coming up. It's coming up. It's about a month away for youth. When we moved to the house that we moved in now, there's this room off the basement, off the east side of our family room in our basement. And I don't know, it's probably about six feet deep and probably 15 feet wide. It's nothing more than a very large closet. And for some closets I've seen, it's not even a large closet. But it was a, it was a, it was a sewing room as much as it pains me to say that. I think it was a sewing room or a crafting room. It was yellow and not very masculine. And, and, and to my wife's great credit, she had a vision with me that I embraced just as readily as she did, and that is that it could be a hunting room. And it was going to take some work, because yellow does not equate with camouflage, and, and the white table that was in there is just a little stark. And, and I know what her motive was, and I, I appreciate it, that, that I have a tendency to spread my hunting stuff from, like it can be in the living room, or kitchen, or bedroom, or bathroom, or in the front yard and certainly in the garage in abundance. And it, I can spread it out. Let's just say I know how to spread my stuff out so that there aren't, there is not so many piles in one place. We can spread those things out. Now, what she did was to say, you know, this could be your hunting room. And I was very, very excited about that. And I manned it up. I've, it's got barn board on the wall. We painted the rest of it brown and, and it smells like hunting stuff now. It's no vague resemblance of a sewing room, except I would have forgotten about that had Wally not reminded me many, many times that it was used. That's the sewing room. He said, well, Can we see your sewing room? If you come over to my house with Wally, and I, I don't have a sewing room. But I do have a hunting room, and I do know this about my hunting room it's an absolute disaster right now. You can't walk into my hunting room. In fact, you can walk into it, but I would, I would literally describe it as dangerous. Because there are sharp, sharp objects, objects in there. And, and as archery season approaches, I'm pretty, it's pretty important that I find some crucial pieces of equipment like my bow. It's in there somewhere. I don't know where it is, but it is in there. And there are many things on the floor that impede my pathway through there to look for the stuff that I need to look for. And every time I go in there, I don't go in there over the summer a lot. Because this is kind of the down season. But when I do go in there, I always come out going, God, I am an absolute mess. I have to clean this up. And I think, well, hunting season's a good four months off. Hunting season's three months. Hunting season's one month away. I've got to clean this place up because I do have to get some stuff out of there that I think is in there. I'm almost certain it's in there. But you know what's motivating me right now is I can see the benefit. Now, I, I'm really, I really want to, and I don't know if I'll get it done this week, but I'm going to try to get it done this week. I really want to get it cleaned up. Now, I hate cleaning up messy rooms, even if it is a hunting room. I just do not like that process of sorting things out and putting them where they go. It's just, it pains me. I don't like it. I don't like it. It's not news to my family. But it, it's hard to make, it's just to motivate me to do that. It really is. But to think about the benefit helps me. To think about the necessity helps me. To think about the fact that I will function much better, not only there, in every area of my life, when things are organized and cleaned and straight and I can find what I'm looking for. I know, I know that I have two packages of broadheads in there somewhere and one of them's open. And so I do have to walk in and reach in uh, slowly and carefully to find what I need to find. You know, it's hard. It is hard to make ourselves do things that we don't want to do. I would contend to you that most of what you do, you do largely, especially on a consistent basis or a regular basis, you do it because you want to do it. You see the value in it, you enjoy it, whatever, but you want to do it. And I would, I would say the opposite too. There are many things that we know we might should do that would be good for us that we don't want to do. And guess what? You don't do them. You should probably eat more broccoli. You should probably eat more lettuce. You should probably run three miles a day. You should probably read classical literature and things like that. We should probably do a lot of things that we don't do. Why? I mean, there's no way to dress that one up, is there? You don't want to do it because you don't see the benefit. Or even if you do see the benefit, you don't see how great enough, the benefit is not great enough to make you endure what it's doing. Just like for three or four months now, I've walked into my hunting room and gone, this is a disaster. I can't find anything. It's starting to smell funny. That's another word for bad. And I just haven't gotten motivated till now. Because I can see the benefit. And the benefit's going to motivate me to make a change. I pray it does motivate me to make a change. But to look past, if, the only way we can really learn to consistently do things that are hard for us to do, that we don't enjoy doing, they're unpleasant, so to look past the doing of them, to look past the doing of them and envision the benefit of doing those things. 
Now, another thing I really, really don't enjoy doing are dishes. Again, it's no surprise to people that are near and dear to me. I don't enjoy the process of putting dishes away, but I really, really do love our kitchen to be tidy and clean. I love that part. So that does motivate me from time to time, not as often as it should, but from time to time, to clean things up, when, especially when it's my turn. Maybe it's exercise. It could be saving money. It could be paying off a debt. It, it, it could be reconciling a relationship. Maybe it's as sim simple as cleaning up the garage or studying for a test that is going to start in about a month and a half students. Many things that we don't necessarily like doing but we benefit from doing them. The only way you're going to do it is to look at the benefit and not the process of doing them. To see the outcome and the benefit or the results. So that's what motivates us, right? Listen, summer jobs for high school and college students, are, are, they're the worst, right? Who wants to hire somebody? I mean, how many good jobs, good paying jobs that are fun and fulfilling and satisfying are available to people who have no job experience and are only gonna work for you two months? How many people are going to, I'll tell you who, McDonald's and, and all the factories in town and the companies and the distribution centers, they'll hire you for two months because no one wants those jobs. They're hard. They're not satisfying. And so they hire people to do that, but they generally have to, especially at, at, at Target or, or Frito-Lay or some of those places, they have really, really, you're unpacking trucks, they have to pay them well to do it, to motivate them to do something no one else wants to, them, wants to do. It, it, there are some disciplines, maybe many, if we're honest, in, the, in our journey to become more and more like Jesus, some spiritual disciplines that will definitely lead us to become more like Jesus, but initially they're either awkward, unpleasant, or unfulfilling. And how do we get past the, 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 our unwillingness to do things that we don't like doing there? to get to that goal. There are disciplines in our journey of following Jesus we just don't want to do. Let's be honest about that. We just don't like them. And it could be a lot of things, and, and everybody's so different that it could be, it, it could be, it could range from a lot of things that maybe getting up early to read your Bible just sounds like a nightmare. If you already get up at 5.30, you say, man, you want me to get up at five o'clock? I'm not even awake. I don't, my brain doesn't catch up with my body until about eight, you know? Or, or maybe it's praying, and you just find it hard to pray or, or, or hard to find time to pray and you just put it off or put it off. Or what about the five things that we, the spiritual disciplines we've asked our congregation to engage and will continue to ask you to engage, like blessing other people. Maybe blessing other people just feels awkward to you or you don't know how to do it or if it feels, it feels kind of strange or, or maybe you just feel too busy to take the time or could it, could it be the second part of that where you're talking about engaging other people, eating with them and engaging them at a more personal level where they can connect with you and you can connect with them. Maybe you just think, man, I just don't have time. I don't have the energy to do that. I don't, I, that just feels kind of strange to me. I, I don't know what to do. And so you back off from that. Or maybe it's learning to, to listen to the Holy Spirit and that just seems so mystical. It might seem kooky to you. Maybe you just think that's just, that's too far out. I'm not that advanced. I'm not. And so it feels awkward or, or strange. And so you don't engage it. Or maybe reading through and, and learning Jesus, as we've asked you to read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, on a regular basis. And you just say, well, that just sounds repetitive and boring. You would never say that out loud in church, right, to read the Gospels. Sounds, but, but maybe you just back away from it for, for reasons like that. Or, or to ad even adopt the mindset, to adopt a mentality, to see your life, to challenge, and it, which is a spiritual discipline, to view your life as a life that is sent from God to be an ambassador to the world that doesn't know Jesus. Maybe that just seems too big for you, too grand for you, too enormous to take on your shoulders. And so you back up from it. I, I know that there are spiritual disciplines that have incredible benefits, but on the front end of those things, we just kind of recoil. We back up and we don't, we don't embrace them for the same reasons most of us don't jog or eat healthy or watch the right things on TV, or read the right kind of books, or all the other things that would benefit us greatly. You know what it changes for us spiritually? Do you know what would really move us forward in, in the journey of becoming more and more like Jesus? It's the impact that becoming like Jesus has on us 
and has on the world around us. It's not just the, the journey. And we've said this a lot, so, so important for you to grasp, to just get a hold of the fact that we at Covenant are not trying to, to teach behaviors just to have you behave a certain way. Our goal is not for you to adopt a list of do's and don'ts so that you can function in an external way uh, that, that looks good. We're not trying to teach you to behave well for Jesus. The goal of the ministry is driven by here is that we could help you become like Jesus so that this inward transformation of the kind of person I am takes place to the degree that the changes of external changes would take place naturally. Now, here's the key to that, that many times we have to change our behaviors long before our heart follows. Sometimes it is in the doing of the discipline that changes not only our conduct, but our character. And so we have, we have made a big deal out of saying that we have to go, we have to do, we have to be obedient, we have to engage spiritual disciplines, adopt behaviors in advance of our heart changing, but not in place of our heart changing. We do not think, and I, I know this is a fact, we do not think that, that that just simply uh, living in conflict with your heart, that is doing things that we don't want to do for the rest of your lives, is the plan that Jesus called us to. That is, he didn't say, well, read the Bible. And you say, why? Well, because that's what a good Christian does. What a, a mature Christian does, a, a spiritually dynamic and devoted person. Well, they read their Bible. Why? Well, just, that's because that's just what you do. Well, why do I pray? Well, because that's just what you do. But there's no other impact? No, you just do it because that's the mark. That's the standard. And, and then prayer becomes an end in and of itself with no ultimate benefit. Reading the Bible does too. Blessing others does too. And right on down the line. But what we want to engage and see is that there is an, there's a result to this. There's, a, there's a, in, an impact in our lives and in the lives of those around us if we engage the things on the front end that God's called us to engage that there's a result to that that is powerful and profound. And I want to show that to you this, this morning. I want to help you get a vision for that and kind of wrap your mind around it. So I ask you this question. What kind of impact can our lives have, could your life have personally, that would compel us to do what we don't feel like doing, compel us to do what we don't feel like doing in order to get there? Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a, an aside here, too. If you're sitting here today and you say, yeah, I don't like reading my Bible, I am not suggesting to you that will be the forever condition of your life. What I am suggesting is that on the front end, you may not like reading your Bible. You may not enjoy it. It may be confusing. You may have questions. It may be weird. I don't know what it may be, but you won't stay that way if you engage and walk with Jesus and engage the spiritual disciplines, things like reading your Bible become a passionate desire of your heart. And that's what, that's what is exciting today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask that question and then say this, that, that the Word of God has some clear, clear answers for us. And that is exciting because when God gives us clarity, we know that there's truth. And when we know there's truth, that there can be real change. So in Apostle Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, he, near the very end of that, he gives us a really clear answer to this question. What could it be like? What kind of impact could these spiritual disciplines have on my life? Could becoming like Jesus really change things? Let's look at that for a few minutes together in 2 Corinthians. Turn in 2 Corinthians to chapter 9 in that book. Chapter 9, and we're going to look at verses 10 through 14. So take a second to find that in your Bible. It'll be on the screen too. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can, you can read along with us on the screen. So turn in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In verse 10 and then stand with me this morning and let's just read this slowly thoughtfully and let God's Word just penetrate here for a minute okay and as we read could I remind you that this is uh, this is the voice of God speaking to us not my voice this is his wisdom his word his message and he wants us to grasp it so let's listen closely Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Verse 11. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality or generosity is another word for that. 
which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. Take note of that thanksgiving theme. It's here a lot. Verse 12. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also, is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God, the recipients of this ministry, and we'll talk about that in a minute. They will glorify God for your obedience. They will glorify God for your obedience. Take note. To your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of the generosity of your contribution to them and to all. Verse 14. While they also by prayer on your behalf yearn for you. Why? Because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let's pray. Father, this is your word. You just spoke to us. And for many of us, it may come out of left field. Maybe we're more concerned about a marriage or a financial situation or our kids or health or a friendship or a job. And maybe this just doesn't seem to connect right now that I just read that scripture and our minds wandered and our hearts are distracted. My prayer, Father, would be that you would take us where we are and you would lead us to the deep waters of your word that would refresh us, fill us, and quench our thirst in most unexpected ways. You know us well. You know our circumstances. You know our challenges. You know our worries our frustrations and our joys and our victories. And you desire to intersect our lives right now in a powerful and relevant way. And I'm going to ask you to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's do this. Uh, some of the language in the, in the New American Standard that I typically use is a little bit uh, hard to translate, uh, hard to grasp. And, and what I've done is kind of put a parallel commentary of the New Living Translation under there. And we're going to go through this in the New Living Translation. And I've, I've, done, I've done the work to make sure that, there's a, that it's good, and it is good. So I just want you to see, I want you to see this, from this from this angle in verse, look at verse 10. Here's what he's saying. He says in, in the New Living Translation, verse 10, it says, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources. That's what he said in verse 10. And when we read that New American Standard just a minute ago, it said, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing. But just as God, what he's saying is this, just as God supplies seed that leads to bread, a grain, literally, you can think of a grain of wheat that ultimately produces a head of wheat and multiple heads of wheat produce bread just as God supplies seeds to farmer that lead to bread he will supply says to the Corinthians he will supply spiritual resources that lead to abundant spiritual impact why is Paul telling them this this would be important stuff basically what is happening is that there are needs for the church in, in Jerusalem and Paul is asking the Corinthians to give, to take up an offering and give to them to supply those needs for the, for the saints in Jerusalem. And this is the second part of it. This is the theme of the second part of 2 Corinthians. The first part of this book is about defending himself and his authority and his val validity as, a, as an apostle and, and credibility as a spiritual leader in their lives. And then now he's talking to them about this gift. And so it has a concrete setting. It has a reason. He's not just pulling this stuff out of thin air. He's encouraging them to, to express their faith in Christ and their Christ-likeness in this gift thing. And so he says, 
It says, God supplies seed to farmers that leads to bread, and he will supply all the spiritual resources that lead to the abundant spiritual impact that he wants to have. So God supplies resources that we need, that you and I need, to accomplish the work that he has for us to accomplish. And that could be far, far more things than just money. This could speak to time. It could te- lead to, uh, speak to material resources. It could speak to emotional energy. All that God gives you what you need to have to invest in the kingdom and, and have the impact that he wants it to have. Okay, so God supplies. That's all he said. Now look at verse 11. He says, in verse 11, he says, Yes, you will be enriched in every way. Same theme. So you can always be generous. You'll be enriched so that you can be generous. Now, you could take this out of context and say, you know what, this sounds like a really good deal for me to get ahead in life. I can, if I give stuff away, God will give me more stuff and I can have more stuff. And then if I'm just quote unquote generous with it, that is I give a little bit away, God keeps giving it to me and this is a good get rich quick scheme. Whatever your desire to be rich in would be. That's a false reading of this. This would be a bad, bad way to read this because what he is saying here is this. He says, now look look at verse 11 again. He says, yes, you will be enriched, Corinthians, in every way, not just monetarily, but every way so that you can be generous. Did you get the last part of that? So that you can be generous. No, not so that you can get stuff, not so that you can be comfortable, not so that you can be rich, not so you can have more, but you'll be enriched so that others can be enriched. You become a conduit, a passageway, a thoroughfare thoroughfare for God to bless people through, that you become the channel of blessing. As you get it in one hand, put it in the other hand, and hand it to somebody else. God, he is saying, will always supply what you need to do that. So he assures them that as they use their resources for the purpose that God gave them, that God will continue God will continue, literally continue to provide abundantly to them so that they will always have enough to invest and to share for the blessing of others. That's the promise there. All right? Now look at verse 12. He says, so two good things are going to result from this ministry of giving. Two good things. When you take up this offering and you give it to the saints in Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem, two good things are going to result. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met. That's a good thing. Somebody who has a need will have the need met. And then second thing is they will joyfully express their thanks to God. So as the congregation of believers behaved and responded like Jesus in Corinth, as that congregation had behaved and responded like Jesus, when they were married aware of a need, two things result. A real need was met. This is not just a, you know, they needed a new TV need. This is a real need. There was a deficit, a financial deficit. And, and the church at Corinth had enough to share because God had given it to them. And, and now they were giving it to the church in, in Jerusalem. And so they were meeting a real need. That always feels good when you're meeting a real need. Many times people have said to me and said to each other, one of the reasons that we don't give more often is we want to make sure that it's going to a real need, right? This was a real need. And God wants to use you And he wanted to use them to meet real needs. And the second thing is, and as a result of giving that gift, they would express great gratitude to God. Cool thing. You give generously. You meet a need. God is glorified as people give thanks to God. They didn't just give thanks to the Corinthians and say, look how how good they are. It was a reflection of who God was in them. It was a reflection of their obedience to him and through that. So look at verse 13. As a result of your ministry, he tells them, They will give glory to God. As a result of what you've done and how you've ministered them, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove, listen closely, will prove that you're obedient to the good news of Christ. So the Corinthians' sincere and obedient generosity, it was sincere, it was not just forced. Paul wasn't leaning in on them, twisting their arm. He was encouraging them. He was explaining them. He was motivating them, but he wasn't blowing on a guilt trip. He wasn't saying, hey, if you don't do this, God's going to dry up everything and you're just going to have nothing. He was explaining the truth and the reality of the matter. And, and through their sincere and obedient generosity was proof that Jesus was living in them, that he was transforming them, that he was changing them, he was making something of them that they weren't that he was making them into new creations. We've started this series nine weeks ago. Brand new. We said brand new. Brand new what? Well, when you become a believer and you put your faith in Christ, you get a brand new spiritual life. True fact that you have a spiritual life that comes into your life 
that did not exist before. That's not philosophical. It's not ideological. It's not a fairy tale. It's a real fact. When a person says, I can't, but Jesus can, and they step over here into the, into the arms of faith in Christ that you are born again a second time, spiritually this time, and you are a brand new spiritual creation. Now, we have a brand new spiritual life, and the second thing we said is that you can then become or get on the journey of becoming a brand new kind of person. That is, the, the kind of person you are can catch up with the spiritual life that you've been given. It can match. You can go through a process that theologians would call sanctification, becoming more and more like Jesus. And you become a brand new kind of person. Paul is pointing to that process in the Corinthians' lives. And he's saying, look, as you have become more and more like Jesus, these incredible things are happening. These needs are being met. God is being glorified. And that is good stuff. That's powerful. What's he trying to motivate them to do? He's saying, look at the end result, because I know that sometimes when you give generously, you sacrifice something. And maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe the Corinthians were giving up something here. Maybe, maybe that there was a significant sacrifice, and there probably was a significant sacrifice being made. But what Paul is trying to do is saying, look at the end goal. Keep your eye on the impact. Two things he said, you're going to meet a real need. Somebody's going to have something they wouldn't have. You're going to bless them. And God is going to be glorified. He pointed to that over and over through this. I wonder, I wonder how many people sitting here today have ever thought about, ask yourself this, have you thought about what it would be like to go to bed at night knowing with certainty that your life on a regular basis was being used just like that to meet real needs and to bring glory and thanksgiving to God? No matter what you do, no matter what phase of life you're in, no matter where you're at, what vocation you have, what you've done in your past or what you will do in your future, no matter what, that what would it be like for you to go to bed at night and put your hands behind your head and close your eyes and drift off to sleep knowing these two things were definite realities in your life. Needs were being met through me. God's doing it, but I'm getting to be the, the partner in that. And then people are saying thanks to God because of my obedience to him. They're, they're, paying th they're saying thanks to God. They're not patting me on the head. They're saying thanks to God. That's a pretty big impact. What would it be like to know that your life was having the kind of impact that changes lives and glorifies God? What would that be like for you? I want to walk through that and just dream about that with you for a few minutes. Maybe, maybe you're an elementary school student. Maybe you're a high school stu student or middle school or, or college student. About a month, you're heading back to school. Don't you love that when people remind you about that? I used to think people were almost sadistic for doing that. It's like, why would you do that to me? What do you mean am I ready to go back to school? What, what, would, it, what would this school year be like for you if you did more than study? If you did more... If you did more than socialize, if you did more than make a new friend, if you did more than participate in band or in drama or in athletics, those are great things, and I hope that you engage extracurricular activities. I hope you do get involved, but what if you did more than that? What if you walked onto the campus that you walk onto every day, Monday through Friday, every morning, knowing that God could well use you to make other people's lives better? Stop. And dream just for a minute reality you walk onto the school campus and you are fully assured that God could very well use you that day to make somebody else's life better what would it be like to have that kind of impact and to know that because that happens people are going to start knowing and seeing and recognizing the goodness of God as a reality on their campus because you're there and you're being obedient because you're becoming more and more and more like Jesus. What would that be like? Or maybe you're stuck in a job. Maybe you're the adult here and you're stuck in a job that maybe in the best case scenario you just don't like it. In the worst case scenario you can't stand it. Maybe it's unfulfilling. Maybe it's unsatisfying. Maybe it's hard. Maybe the relationships are bad. Whoever. Maybe you don't get paid enough, recognized enough, enough pats on the back. Maybe it doesn't carry meaning and significance for you. And you just are there Literally, to get paid, to pay the bills, to buy the groceries, to do it over again. What 
What if by the end of this year, by the end of 2015, you started walking through the doors of your workplace as a woman, as a man, on a mission? Knowing that that day, that next eight-hour span of time or 12-hour span of time was in all likelihood going to involve God using you to intersect somebody else's life to bless them, to meet a need, and to make their life better, to provide hope, to provide comfort, to impart wisdom, to encourage, to meet a physical need, and to know that as that happens over and over in that workplace, day in and day out, regardless of what you get paid, regardless of what your boss said, regardless of who got passed over, regardless of the conflicts that are there, regardless of how meaningless the job itself may feel, you know God is using you day in and day out to make other people's lives better. And that ultimately people are pointing back to God and saying, thank you, God. Or maybe you're a retired person today and you've, you've entered that phase of life where the American dream is realized, you've worked hard, you've saved well, and now you've got all the time in the world to do what you want to do. You're engaging hobbies. You're going on vacations. And somehow it's starting to feel more empty than you ever thought it would feel. That is, the more you focus on you and the more you do for you, the less you actually enjoy it. And you're wondering, why did you work all these years to have this experience? What would it be like for you, retired person, to again, go to bed at night, knowing that no matter what else took place in the last 50 years prior to this time, or 40 or whatever, that right now God was bringing you into a brand new phase of significance and relevance and impact. That your freedom of time and resources can be devoted to the cause of meeting needs in other people's lives that are real, that are tangible, that impact people right here and right now and that when they're met other people point to God and say thank you wouldn't that be better than saying man I get to do anything I want to do and that's starting to make me nauseous wouldn't it be better than saying wow what's the next thing I can do what's the next thrill I can adventure I can go on and and it ultimately you just spend and whittle away your years on this earth just pleasing you do you remember what Paul told the Corinthians just a minute ago, he said, God will supply everything you need to be selfish. No. He said, God will supply everything you need to be generous. I know it's hard as a pastor, as a communicator, I know it's very hard to get people beyond where you are when you get here to where we can be and even where we should be. Because I know that, that even on the ride here that parenting can get in the way and there can be, there can be marital squabbles, there could be financial stress that you know you're going to wake up and meet tomorrow, there could be a health crisis looming, there could be all kinds of things and then to somehow come here and hear a preacher say, you know what, it can be better, yay you. It can all sound like a, you know, a cheerleading thing that doesn't have a whole lot of substance to it but I want to tell you this this morning, this is the real deal. This is what God really has in plan for his people. And it all starts with seeing the end product. Don't you want to know that life really matters beyond just pleasing you? Don't you want to know that you can be used, that you're not stuck, that it's not too late and it's not too early, that God can take hold of your life and he can bring glory to himself by you Meeting, meeting needs of other people, whether it's what Ennio talked to us about yesterday, about offering pastoral care and, 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 and uh, counseling to others, or, or just being there to, as a person of presence, of peace and, and godliness, <coughs> or whether it's giving greatly to the financial needs of somebody else. How do you accomplish all that? <coughs> How do you do it? I mean, it sounds like a, a pipe dream, quite honestly, when you're sitting here and you know, I'm just kind of intersecting your life and with this, all, all this stuff. And it just sounds like, well, <coughs> that can happen. <coughs> that can happen for the select few. Oh, if you go into ministry, you can have that kind of life. If you give yourself to a, as a missionary, you can have that life. 
But what if you work at Goodyear or you're a plumber or you're a teacher or you're a housewife or you're a retired person? I'm telling you, it can happen. Here's, let's look at this. There's two things I want to really embed again. And I believe these are from God, and I believe that this is something that should be our mantra. I believe that we have to etch it into the very, very flesh of our hearts. That is, we never settle for behaving over becoming. Don't ever settle for that. How do you know if you're doing that? <clears throat> You'll know if you're doing that if, if whatever you're doing is in conflict to your heart, but you feel like you should do it anyway. You know you should be generous, but you hate it every time you give something away. You know you should read the Bible, but you're bored every time you pick it up. That's not how it has to stay. Remember this, it may start that way. If you're going to run a 5K, if you're going to run a marathon, you're going to start off and run a mile and hate it. But after you run a mile and get in shape and you run two miles and three miles and pretty soon you begin to enjoy running. I asked Mike, who had just started running again, do you enjoy it? He said, yeah. Because I ran twice last week and I was like, I hate this. <laughs> I hate this. Maybe it would help if I started saying, hey, I love this. <laughs> I love this. My legs hate this. <laughs> I love this, but my lungs are screaming out for me to stop. You don't ever have to settle for that kind of spiritual existence where your heart is in radical conflict to your conduct. That those two things, spiritual transformation, bring those two things into alignment. That what you want is what you begin to do, and you begin to do what you want. And we got to get that down. Don't settle for merely behaving well for Jesus when you can become more and more like Jesus. Now, second thing, start practicing spiritual disciplines for the purpose of becoming more and more like Jesus, not just to do them, okay? Don't just read the Bible to alleviate guilt. Don't just pray so you can say you did. Don't just show up at a worship service so somebody doesn't say, hey, where were you? Don't just be generous so that you can say, I was generous. Everything you do in terms of spiritual disciplines, we're asking you to do with a heart's desire that God would use it to help you become more like Jesus, no matter what it is. We have a whole group of people that mow our yard. Aren't you thankful that we don't have weeds that are six feet tall out there? And I know those guys are out there doing it. They're doing it because they, they've become like Jesus, but I know that they're not out there going, God, I hate doing that, I hate doing that. that. They are, they, I know Roger comes in here, Trey comes in here, and Benson's out. Benson waves at me every Thursday morning, terrifies me with a weed eater outside my window. I think the chainsaw massacre is starting right over again. And there's Benson with a massive weed eater waving at me. If you didn't know Benson, you would be terrified because Benson's like six foot three and 275 pounds of muscle and fur. And he's standing outside of your window with, a, with machinery that's going. Rawr. But they're not, listen, whatever we do, Word or deed, we do it for this purpose of becoming, not just doing, but becoming. So never settle for behaving over becoming. Start doing what you do for the purpose of becoming like Jesus. And let God transform not just how you behave, but the kind of person you are. Be free of living in conflict to your heart. Hi, Benson. <laughs> yeah, you... you and you leave, and I'll do the same about you. <laughs> I did not know you were gone. Or I would have added a few things. Like the Corinthians, like the Corinthians in this passage, you will do the things with heartfelt, sincere desire to bless others and to meet the needs. And like the Corinthians, your life is going to begin to have an exponential impact because God promises that. And those around you are going to see and recognize the kingdom. I'm drawn to this last verse that we read and I'm just going to let it soak in before we offer this challenge he says while they also by prayer on your behalf yearn for you the Jerusalem Christians yearning for the Corinthians Christians who are not all put together this is kind of a whacked out messed up church in Corinth they yearn for you why because of the surpassing let this soak in because of the surpassing grace of God in you. They yearn for you because Jesus is real 
in your life. I want you to... uh, I want you to remember why we do what we do matters. Okay, why we do what we do matters, especially in the realm of spiritual disciplines. And I want you to ask yourself, why do I read the Bible? Why do I pray? Why do I come to a worship service? Why do I attend a G2 group? Why do I go to a group Bible study? Why do I give financially to the church? Pick, pick a spiritual discipline that you're doing right now or one that you will begin doing. And I want you, every time you engage that spiritual discipline, I want you to stop. And I want you to do this for the next 30 days. Every time, I don't care if it's reading your Bible or praying or tithing or or mowing the yard or whatever you do. I want you to stop beforehand and say, I am doing this primarily so that I can become like Jesus. Spiritual disciplines, by the way, are nothing more than things that you do that give God access to your heart so that he can change who you are, not just what you do. They're things that you do to give God access to your heart so that God can change not who you are, not just what you do. Now, I want you to pick a spiritual discipline, and whatever it is, find out why you, ask yourself, those are good questions. Why do I read the Bible? And please, even if this is the real answer, lie to me if I ask you. Don't say, well, that's just what Christians do. No. Atheists read the Bible too. <laughs> they do, I promise. We don't read it because we're Christians. We read it to become like Jesus to connect with God and to grow in our likeness of Christ. Pick one or remind yourself every time you do it, I am doing this so that I can become more like Jesus. Maybe it's one of those BELLS acronyms, blessing others, engaging others while eating with them, or, or, or learning to listen to the Holy Spirit, or learning Jesus, or living a sent life. Just do those things for the right reason. Begin to say, primarily I'm doing this so that I can become like Jesus. And I'm gonna ask you this, this thought. Can you imagine? I mean, dream with me just for a second. The 150 or 60 people that regularly attend here, let's just take half of it. Can you imagine 75 or 80 people who over the next year become increasingly more like Jesus? That is their character, their heart, everything about them just begins to take on the flavor of Jesus. Can you imagine the impact that's going to have on Topeka, Kansas? Could you imagine 75 people who are not just doing good things, but for the right reasons, because they're beginning to be expressions of the kind of people we are. It is good to do things well in advance of our heart changing. Listen, I especially want you to tithe whether you don't want to do it or not, okay? We, that, you know, you just, you just do that. I want you to say nice things about me long before you realize that they're true. <laughs> We do things, not just to get them done, but to become, okay? So, I want you to engage that for 30 days. Really, 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 truly, truly give this heart. I th- usually I try a week, but I just think this is something that we have to say. If we're serious here, let's give this 30 days doing what we do for a different reason. And then imagine what's it going to be like if over the next year or five years, We've developed a culture of people who says, you know, you've got a covenant, you know, you're going to be expected to become like Jesus, and that's an amazing, amazing ride. You don't have to live in conflict to your heart. You don't have to just do things to do them. You can literally become a different kind of person, a brand new kind of person. Pray with me. Father, I want to thank you for the last nine weeks, and thank you that the moment when I was 17 years old and I gave my life to Jesus. As scary and and bewildering as that was, that that was the moment that I got a brand new spiritual life that I never had before. What was dead was alive. What was lost was found. And that, boy, since that time, Father, That has been an up and down journey. And I'm thankful today that you stayed with me in those many, many low spots. And you picked me back up. And you kept working. And you kept changing and transforming. So today I'm just praying that my brothers and sisters who are in this room, many of whom are very likely stuck in just doing, just behaving, just following rules, modifying our conduct, 
never paying any attention to our character. That we would be set free together. And that we would be released upon Topeka, Kansas to be the blessing that you've called us to be. That, that through us, God, we would meet real needs and that many thanksgivings would be returned to you. That would be an amazing reality. Would you bring it to pass, Father, because only you can? And we'll ask you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen.